Hello, my name is Devlina Samantha. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Professor Chad Merkin's group at Northwestern University. Today, I'm very excited to be sharing with you some of the work that I've done as a graduate student at Stanford and as a postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University. Very broadly speaking, my research interests are in the design, synthesis, and study of size-confined materials with the goal of using these materials to solve outstanding challenges in biology and medicine. For example, one of the biggest challenges in medicine is being able to deliver drugs in a controlled manner. To address this challenge, my PhD work was focused on designing nanoparticles of conducting polymers that can act as capsules and release drugs when a small electric stimulus, something on the order of one volt, is applied to them. We developed a platform type technology that can release a wide variety of drugs in a programmable manner to treat diseases such as diabetes, chronic pain, or even cancer. In parallel, I was involved in studying reactions that occur within small droplets of water. Now, this is where we made the surprising discovery that many molecules that are completely stable in bulk water are spontaneously reduced when the size of these droplets are reduced to the micron scale. Moreover, many reactions are accelerated by orders of magnitude in this confined environment. So this had a tremendous scientific implication. If we were to look at the size of the droplets that we were studying, they're around 30 microns in diameter. If we were to look at the size of a biological cell, we see that that's of similar dimensions. Now, a biological cell is comprised 70% of water. So we can think of a living cell as a crowded micro droplet. So this implies that reactions that occur within living cells, but are inferred from bulk measurements may need to be reevaluated. So this is what inspired me to pursue my postdoctoral work, which seeks to answer how can we design or engineer chemical probes that would allow us to look at the various molecules inside of living cells. Now, studying molecules in live cells is very important, but it is also very difficult. Important because everything that the cell is and the cell does is because of the molecules that are inside of the cell. Every disease can be traced back to the dysregulation of one or more of these molecules. Now, there are some methods that are very powerful, not perfect, but powerful methods of looking at certain classes of analytes within cells. For example, genetically encoded fluorescent proteins can allow one to study proteins in cells. Methods such as FISH and PCR allow one to study nucleic acids in cells. However, not all of these techniques allow one to study analytes in live cells. Importantly, there are many molecules in cells that are very, very hard to detect with any existing techniques, and these are called the dark matter of cells. So the question that we wanted to ask was, is there a general platform that we can design that would allow one to detect not only nucleic acids and proteins in cells, but almost any analyte within a cell? To detect different molecules in cells, we realized that we can use nucleic acid sequences as recognition sequences. And this is because nucleic acids can recognize both nucleic acid and non-nucleic acid targets. For example, we can have a single strand of DNA that can recognize single-stranded nucleic acids such as mRNA through hybridization. On the other hand, nucleic acid sequences called aptamers can be evolved through combinatorial selection techniques to bind to specific ions, small molecules, or even proteins. Even though nucleic acid-based recognition sequences are powerful for detecting a wide variety of cell-related molecules outside of cells, for example, in buffer, they cannot be used to detect analytes inside cells. This is because linear nucleic acids do not enter cells because of the presence of the cell membrane. Moreover, there are enzymes called nucleases that rapidly chop up linear nucleic acids. So we have a problem of getting inside the cell and we have a problem of stability. The Merkin group has shown that if we were to take DNA and RNA sequences and arrange them in a spherical orientation by densely functionalizing them around a central nanoparticle core, we can obtain what is called a spherical nucleic acid architecture. And this particular structure, the spherical nucleic acid or SNA, has several emergent properties. For example, 
these structures bind to complementary DNA or RNA sequences up to two orders of magnitude more strongly compared to linear sequences, get taken up into cells much more compared to linear sequences, and are more resistant to nuclease degradation. With the SNA architecture, now we are equipped to make nucleic acid-based probes that would function inside live cells. So that Merkin group developed what are called nanoflares, which was the first platform that allowed live cell genetic analysis. So in this platform, you have a gold nanoparticle that acts as the core, and you have sequences called recognition sequences densely functionalized onto this gold nanoparticle. The recognition sequence recognizes whatever target that we are interested in. To this recognition sequence, short fluorophore label flare strands are hybridized. Now the gold nanoparticle here acts as a quencher. So when the fluorophore is in close proximity to gold, it is not fluorescent. However, when the target molecule, let's say an mRNA sequence, comes in and binds, it displaces the fluorophore label strand. And because it is no longer in close proximity to gold, it can fluoresce. So it was shown that we can use this platform to detect mRNA in living cells. For example, cells that express survivin and are treated with a nanoflare that targets the survivin mRNA fluoresce much brighter than cells that express survivin but are treated with a nanoflare that does not target survivin. Nanoflares have enabled several new technologies. For example, they were the first platform that allowed the isolation of circulating tumor cells in life form based on genetic markers. Moreover, nanoflares allow high throughput drug screening and can even be used to detect disease tissue in vivo. Now, like any first generation platform, while it is important to recognize the advantages of this system, it is also important to ask the question, what are the limitations of the system? Turns out for nanoflares, it is the occurrence of false positive signal through several different pathways. For example, nucleus degradation, dehybridization of the flare sequence, or detachment of the DNA sequences from the surface of the gold nanoparticle could all result in a fluorescent signal. Now, we get this false positive signal because this is a fluorophore quencher based system where the fluorescence is dependent on the distance of the fluorophore from the quencher. So the question that we asked was, can we develop a quencher free strategy that would then overcome these issues? To do this, we looked at nature for inspiration. So at the very beginning, I told you about fluorescent proteins. Here I posed the question, why are fluorescent proteins fluorescent in the first place? If we were to look at the chromophore of green fluorescent protein, we see that in its structure, it has an internal methane bridge around which it can rotate. Because of these internal rotations, when the protein is denatured, this molecule is non-fluorescent. In the intact protein, the internal rotations are restricted as a result of which the protein fluoresces. So what is the equivalent of this in a DNA system? The answer is DNA intercalators. So these molecules are non-fluorescent by themselves, but when they intercalate between DNA base pairs, their internal rotation is restricted and their fluorescence turns on. However, if we were to use DNA intercalators that can freely intercalate between any base pairs, we would be getting random signals. So we want to develop a system where we get selective intercalation only when target binding occurs. So to do this, we developed what are called forced intercalation aptomers in which a DNA sequence is in an unstructured form. So we take an aptomer sequence, which is more or less unstructured. So we attach to this a viscosensitive dye that can freely rotate. However, when the aptomer binds its target, the dye is forced to intercalate or fit between the base pairs as a result of which its fluorescence is turned on. We then went on to show that we can design fit aptomers for every known aptomer target binding mode. And using these fit aptomers, we can detect analytes ranging from ions to small molecules to even proteins. So we showed that we can detect markers of heavy metal poisoning, stress, and thrombosis in complex media such as human serum at nanomolar sensitivity. So in a nutshell, fit aptomers are the only light up aptomer probe that can detect a wide variety of targets with only a single modification. Now that we have developed a quencher free strategy, we are poised to develop the next generation of nanoflares. So 
we don't really need to use gold anymore because this is a quencher free system. So that gives us access to biodegradable and more biocompatible probes. So as an example, we chose to use a protein core. So in this next generation nanoflare, the nucleic acid shell would not only facilitate cellular uptake, but you can detect analytes using forced intercalation aptamers. And we used a protein core because not only do protein cores allow you to make site-specific modifications so we can attach different elements on the protein surface at definite positions, but we can also use the protein's recognition capabilities to detect additional molecules down the line. So this strategy is resistant to false positive signal and therefore would give us greater quantitative capabilities. As a proof of concept, we chose pH as an analyte as it is dysregulated in many diseases such as cancer. And to do this, we chose a DNA sequence that goes from an unfolded state at pH of 7.5 to a quadruplex structure at a pH of 5.5. We then functionalized fit aptamers that would recognize this pH change onto a beta galactosidase protein core. And what we observed is cells that are treated with these constructs and are clamped at a pH of 5.5 are almost twice as fluorescent as cells that are clamped at a pH of 7.5, indicating that our newly designed fit flares are capable of detecting analytes intracellularly. We next wanted to see if we can use a functional protein core to detect analytes for which nucleic acid-based recognition sequences are not known. As an example, we chose glucose as the analyte, which is associated with many diseases such as cancer and diabetes. And we chose glucose oxidase as the protein core in this case. So once glucose oxidase SNAs enter the cells, they react with intracellular glucose and produce hydrogen peroxide. So by using a dye, that fluoresces in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, we were able to monitor intracellular glucose levels. So when we used our glucose oxidase SNAs in buffer, we saw up to 120 fold fluorescence enhancement in the presence of glucose. And the signal enhancement was also very, very specific for glucose over other structurally analogous sugars. Importantly, when we treat cells with these glucose oxidase SNAs, we see that the fluorescence of the cells increases as you are sensing glucose. We next asked a question, what happens to the fluorescent signal when the intracellular levels of glucose are increased or decreased by adding external reagents? If glucose oxidase SNAs are able to report the change in intracellular glucose levels, this would indicate that they could be potentially used for high throughput drug screening. As examples, we looked at the fluorescence response when cells are treated with insulin, which is known to increase glucose uptake. We found that the fluorescence does indeed increase. On the contrary, when cells are treated with cytochalicin B, which is known to decrease glucose uptake, we saw a corresponding decrease in fluorescence signal. These results indicate that glucose oxidase-based probes could be potentially used for drug screening. So in today's talk, I told you how we can use nucleic acid sequences to design probes that would allow one to look at molecules that are associated with cells. I started by introducing the concept of aptamers and how we have developed forced intercalation aptamers that selectively turn on when they bind their specific targets. Then I introduced the concept of a spherical nucleic acid, whereby arranging nucleic acids into a spherical architecture allows them to be introduced inside cells. And based on spherical nucleic acids, the first probe that was developed was called the nanoflare, which allowed live cell genetic and metabolic analysis. However, the nanoflares had some limitations, for example, false positive signal. And to overcome this, we developed a fundamentally new signaling strategy based on forced intercalation, which led to the development of fit flares where we can not only use the nucleic acid sequence to detect analytes, but we can also use a functional nanoparticle core for detecting analytes for which nucleic acid recognition sequences may not be present. And this allows us to make intracellular measurements with much more quantitative capabilities. Beyond biology, SNAs can be used as building blocks to synthesize materials from the bottom up by programmed assembly. I have done a little bit of work on that front, and if you're interested to know more, please view my other talk in the Biomimetic Materials session.
For the work presented today, I would like to thank Professor Merkin for giving me the opportunity of working in his lab, and I would also like to thank all my wonderful collaborators without whom this work would not have been possible. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me through the AKI chat or through email. Thank you for your attention.